Hello. Uh, I just would like to mention to all the all in the auditorium and to the Zoom audience that we are still waiting for the speaker, Professor Ashutosh Kotwal, to arrive to TIFR. He is a bit delayed uh, because of the rains. Um, so I I'm hoping he'll be here in five to ten minutes. Sorry for a little bit of a delay. Hi, Ramki. Um, sorry, we are actually delayed. Um, uh, our speaker is not yet here. So we are waiting for the speaker and then when he comes, we will start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ramki.
wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, it's just a request. Um, if a few of the faculties who are actually there in Mumbai in the institute, if they can come to the Homi Bhava, it would be great. Um, uh, we we are still expecting the speaker, but it would be better if we if the faculty members here in the Zoom could actually physically be here in the Homi Bhava, it will uh, it will be much better and make the speaker feel warm. So please uh, try to attend from Homi Bhava. Just got a message. Speaker has reached the IFR. Thank you. Um, I, I think uh, Professor Sunil Gupta, you gave that information. Yeah, just I received a message from Ashutosh. Thank you. That he has, thank you. Thank you. He has for... reached the gate. Yeah, <laughs> I just like, two three minutes back. Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. We're just waiting. Yeah. If, if somebody were to guide him, because he will not know where to go. Yes. Well, he knows. Gagan, Baba, Gagan you know. is there. I think Gagan oh, is. Oh, good. Yeah. Gagan is oh, coordinating. Good, good. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I hope you are doing well. Yeah, I'm fine. It's pretty yeah, early morning. Waiting. It's pretty early yeah. morning. <laughs> Yeah, it's six thirty. <laughs> six yeah, forty yeah. actually. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Sure. See you. Yeah. Hello, Professor.
I'm sorry, please hold on. Uh, he should be any moment in, in the auditorium. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, uh, Professor Ashutosh Kotwal is just making his way to the Homi Bhabha Auditorium. And I would like to sort of uh, say a few things before he comes in. Um, so this particular colloquium is an atypical colloquium because it's organized on a Tuesday. Uh, normally, NSF colloquiums are organized on a Wednesday, as you all mostly know. Uh, this is atypical simply because, of course, the speaker is with us. And um, the other reason is that we are also sort of partnering with Asset Colloquium Series that Dr. Uh, Satyanarayana actually hosts on a Friday. So this is a special NSF and Asset Colloquium that has been organized because Dr. Kotwal was here physically. So um, so I, I know this is off your timetable, but thank you for making time and uh, coming to the auditorium for the special uh, uh, colloquium. Um, we are also on a different location simply because TIFR is hosting a very prominent series called the Vigyan Vidyushi, which allows for uh, women uh, scholars to come to TIFR and learn more about different kinds of science um, happening in TIFR. Uh, computer science, physics, and other kinds of uh, very interesting activities. So there are a lot of um, uh, girl scholars who are in TIFR at this point, and uh, it's a very, um, uh, very nice program that TIFR organizes. So uh, so that's the other reason that we have moved our location to Homi Bhava Auditorium. Um, with that, I just would like to also welcome all of you uh, in the Zoom and uh, the uh, people here for this edition of the NSF Colloquium. I, uh, I would like to remind everyone that this colloquium series um, was first conceived by Professor Homi Bhabha, our founding director, um, who actually envisioned bringing uh, different members from the natural sciences that comprises of physics, chemistry, and biology under one roof so that um, it is always nice to hear together um, an expert, uh, an eminent expert uh, in one of the subtopics, subdisciplines of uh, uh, either of these natural sciences uh, communities, um, uh, sort of uh, discuss the science as well as have a very nice, um, you know, discussions after the talk that allows for collaborations. So we are very happy that our speaker is here, Professor Ashutosh Kotwal. So thank you. Uh, Professor Kodwal, thank you for making way. Um, I would like to um, sort of uh, now uh, welcome Professor Gagan Mohanty, um, who actually is hosting Professor Kotwal along with uh, Professor Sunil Gupta uh, to kindly uh, give words of introduction to Professor Kotwal. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, sorry that it's a little bit uh, 10 minutes late than what we thought. But anyway, so I, I'll be very brief. Um, so it's so in, indeed a pleasure to um, introduce uh, the speaker for the colloquium today, Professor Kotwal. Um, he's actually the local here. I mean, he was born in Mumbai and did his study, I mean, he went to um, University of Pennsylvania in a full scholarship um, and got the dual degree with this uh, 
you know, the highest uh, honor uh, in electrical engineering, as well as, um, you know, the top school of Wharton School uh, Economics with finance major. Um, and um, then he did a PhD from Harvard University in physics in 1995 and um, went for postdoc in Columbia University. Um, and um, uh, right now he's the, uh, the Prince London Distinguished Professor of Physics at uh, Duke University. As for the, uh, his main research and, and what he'll be talking about, uh, he has been a pioneer of this uh, search for the Higgs boson and uh, as part of, uh, part of this Atlas experiment. But what he's going to talk about is old love, this um, you know, precision measurement of the W boson. This is the so-called messenger of the weak interaction. And um, this is uh, being substantially uh, differing from the standard model prediction. And so he will uh, give us a tour. And, and since we are late, I, I don't want to take your time. And with this, uh, uh, let's um, um, welcome Professor Katwal. It's not a dot. It's not a dot. Can see the arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Support is in the zoom. Okay. Fine. I have to get my bearing on where the arrow is. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> very good. Thank you very much. It is really a pleasure and a privilege to be invited here to present this colloquium. And as was mentioned, I thank you for the kind words of introduction. And I should have remembered the Bombay monsoon. I've been here many times, but somehow never in the monsoon season. And I underestimated by a few minutes some two hour journey, which was supposed to be only one hour or something like this. So on that note, let us get started. So this science paper you probably have seen, uh, it was published uh, April 8th. And since then there were, I'm told hundreds and hundreds, something like 800 media, media mentions. And so what is the issue that um, has triggered some attention and let us see how the whole thing pans out. It is also kind of coincidental um, that in fact, July 4th, exactly in 2012. So right now there are, Higgs celebration uh, events going on at CERN and US in various places. So it is really quite opportune that we are discussing that perhaps we are learning there is more to the standard model of physics. There is more to nature at the fundamental level in particle physics than this theory that was based on the Higgs boson and a theory of matter and forces all put together. In other words, the calculated value of this quantity called the W boson is a little different, but significantly different from what uh, we have measured here in this paper. So let us see what the implications of that might be. But the story will, I will start with is a story of particle physics. 
um, I'm told there was also a Rushi called Kanad Rushi who thought about what the fundamental constituents of all matter and forces might be. This logic has gone around for a long time, the idea that there are undivisible or undividable elements that contain fundamental properties. Later on, of course, it was understood, I'm not sure I'm able to control this mouse very well, that molecules are the elements of, uh, of chemical substances and they were made up of atoms. And at some point, positive and negative charges were also understood. So now comes 20, uh, 1911, and we all know the famous experiment that was done in 1911 by the students of Rutherford and Rutherford himself. Perhaps I should not advance this way. Advance this way. This is what works. Very good. So this experiment, well-known experiment that nuclear radiation was discovered. So they knew alpha particles and beta particles. So he had a beam of alpha particles and that was going through a gold foil. And the expectation was essentially all the alpha particles would go forward but there was occasionally a highly reflected alpha particle. And so there was in, in, in this once in a while, a bright fluorescent spot on the screen coming back sometimes almost at 180 degrees. So this completely overturned the understanding of how atoms or whatever the fundamental unit of elements was. There was the so-called plum pudding or Thomson model where charges positive and negative were uniformly mixed up. So there you can estimate from mathematics or even your intuition, that the attraction and repulsion forces on the alpha particle coming from the positive and the negative would almost cancel out. And so there would not be possible to have a strong attraction or a very strong repulsion force. On the other hand, if you really flip an alpha particle backwards by almost 180 degrees, then it is clear that this logic doesn't work. A, you need a very strong repulsive or attractive um, center. Secondly, by momentum conservation, knowing the mass of the alpha particle, you know that something much heavier has to be there in order to reflect it back by such a large angle. So immediately you get the notion that there has to be a very concentrated, very localized source of large amount of charge. So therefore you get the idea that there must be a concentrated nucleus and then the other charge by definition has to be outside that core. So it has to be surrounding it. So you can make some kind of Bohr model or you can make a solar system like model but immediately this tells you, A, if a lot of charge is localized so strongly, it has to mean that there has to be a force much, much larger than the electric force because the positive charge or negative charge doesn't matter which one it is. But if it is so strongly localized, it must be repelling itself. So why is this nucleus not falling apart? So there has to be a strong force which is overwhelming the electric repulsion. And secondly, these electrons somehow around that positive charge why are they not falling into the nucleus? Even if they were rotating, they would be accelerating by centripetal force and accelerating charge would radiate. So these electrons ought to radiate away all their energy and the atom is fundamentally unstable if you did not know about quantum mechanics. So immediately the idea of standing waves and so on, that these electrons are actually orbiting not as little points going around, but a very different way of looking at it, that these are standing waves uh, and therefore they are stable. Uh, is the idea that that spawned the, the origin of quantum mechanics in many ways. So as soon as you go to wave mechanics, you realize that there is a fundamental sort of conjugate nature of position and energy or position momentum or time and energy. And so immediately you get the uncertainty principle. So this is buried in the logic that everything is fundamentally understood as waves. So from the uncertainty principle, you see right away that if you want to probe smaller distances, eventually going inside the proton and neutron and understanding that there are little things called quarks inside, then you must have beams of higher and higher energy. So this was the progression that occurred. So in some sense, Rutherford maybe is the first particle physics experiment and we are doing this beam scattering logic ever since. So some famous names here, there is uh, Wolfgang Pauli, there is Heisenberg and Fermi here in this picture. And here is what eventually happened in the early 1970s we have deep inelastic scattering. So a high energy electron is emitting a wave. So this is the description of the electromagnetic force that a wave representing the electromagnetic radiation ultimately quantized as photons is able to penetrate way inside the proton. And so in this depiction, these little points, these colored circles are the quarks inside the proton. And rather than scattering off the entire proton, you are eventually able to scatter on the tiny little points that are inside the proton. So we'll come back to this other thing, these uh, orange or yellow waves, 
are the strong force mediators which are binding the quarks together. So we'll come back to this logic in a bit. But the understanding that the point-like scattering that was occurring that was observed in this high energy electron scattering, which is therefore called deep inelastic scattering, is another pioneering set of experiments done at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center that continues this trend of quantum mechanics. Okay, so now we know how much impact quantum mechanics has had. People estimate 40, 50, 60%. I don't know exactly how economics would do it, but uh, you know, a large part of our lives, everything that is going around in the economy is one way or the other connected with quantum principles at the material level or electronics level or molecular biology level and so forth. So just some pictures to show you how much quantum mechanics is going on all around us. Well, at the same time, there was Einstein. So he was developing first the theory of special relativity, then the theory of general relativity, which became the theory of gravity. So what happened was people started thinking, is it possible to unify the principles of quantum, which don't really have much to do with the principles of special relativity? But is there a unified theory that will combine the axioms of both of them? So this became relativistic, relativistic quantum theory, which eventually became relativistic quantum field theory. So one of the original initiators of this uh, attempt to unify these two ideas was Paul Dirac. And you can see him here in the middle, uh, along with, I believe, uh, there is, this is probably Schrodinger, and this is probably Pauli, I believe. And you can, of course, recognize Einstein, and there is Madame Curie many, many geniuses here in the beginning of the 20th century. And I think uh, 19 of these people had a Nobel Prize already or were going to win a Nobel Prize very soon. So a lot of important people at some conference happening uh, sometime in the 1919 or 1920, something like this. So what did he do? He started thinking, as we know, about the theory of matter particles, about how to build a relativistic equation for an electron that would also obey the principles of quantum mechanics. So one way to sort of visualize without getting into the math, how the mathematics of an electron develop is if you want to think of fundamentally what a particle's angular momentum might be. So in other words, think of a wave pattern that carries angular momentum. The simplest is the one that we discovered the most recently. So it's sort of uh, ironic. The simplest quantum you can imagine is something that has no angular momentum. In other words, if you were to rotate it, it does not change at all. So that you might say is the simplest you can imagine, but the Higgs boson, which is exactly that idea, is the most latest fundamental particle that actually has been discovered. And as we think ahead of the quantum mechanics and special relativity and everything of the standard model of physics, it turns out that that particular nature of the Higgs boson, which is the fact that it has zero angular momentum, is in fact the thing that makes many aspects of the Higgs theory, the most peculiar, the least satisfying, and perhaps has the most mathematical um, funny business, shall we say, about it. On the other hand, the next most simplest thing you can do is when in units of Planck's constant, if you do the um, uh, dimensional analysis, you will see that Planck's constant actually has units of angular momentum. So in units of Planck's constant, you might say that going from zero one might be the next natural step in angular momentum. It turns out that half unit of Planck's constant as angular momentum is actually the simplest thing you can do after that. So the entire theory of matter is based on the fact that matter particles have half a unit of angular momentum. So what is so special about the number half? First of all, you can show by the mathematics that the half implies that it has a certain amount of magnetic spin uh, because of the angular momentum. And so that means the electron, for example, acts like a small bar magnet. So it can either point up this way or down this way to different configurations of a bar magnet. And you can show that because it's a half, there's only two options. There is no other option. It can be either this way or this way. So those two states become the two spin states uh, of any matter particle, including an electron. This number half will play a special role. One can see what angular momentum does in the mathematical theory. It tells you what happens when you rotate a particle by a certain angle. The amount of angular momentum tells you exactly how much that wave changes by. When you take a half, this coefficient becomes the exponent. So e raised to i times pi divided by two. So e raised, sorry, e raised to i pi, right? It's two pi divided by two, which means if you rotate by 360 degrees, this half makes a phase of e raised to i pi. 
Now, normally you would expect a phase of E raised to I times two pi because you've just rotated by two pi, which means you come back to yourself, right? E raised to I pi is exactly one. But this half does something very tricky and very magical. It divides the angle by two, and therefore you get raise, E raised to I pi, which is minus one. So that means an electron is a special kind of object which rotated by 360 degrees, unlike your intuition, becomes negative of itself, which for a wave is not a peculiar thing. It might be peculiar for a point, you know, hard to visualize what a negative of a point is, but a negative of a wave in quantum mechanics is nothing extraordinary. It just means the wave has become flipped and so it has inverted and become negative of itself. So in that sense, the wave function of the electron becoming negative of itself is no uh, intrinsic contradiction, shall we say. It just sounds intuitively strange that the wave would flip and not come back to what it was. At the same time, there was a very interesting puzzle going on in quantum. There were people who were starting to solve many body problems uh, quantum mechanically. And there was a puzzle in the sense that various properties they were calculating weren't quite working out when people thought of the number of modes that were possible. So even classical physics, you count the number of modes. In a quantum system, you can also count the number of modes. And the mode counting logic wasn't working out until Bose made a very interesting and very important point, which in fact, as we all know, was not quite accepted for a while. And it was Einstein's support that eventually got that paper accepted. So that became the Bose-Einstein statistics. But to a large extent, it is really Bose statistics. So he made the point that all particles of the same type, electron or photon or anything else, if they really are the same type of particle, then unlike the classical vision, that even if I made you know, 10 uh, soccer balls and I made them exactly identical, I can still look at one, second, third, fourth, and say that you know, that's the first one, that's the second one, and somehow I can tell them apart. For quantum objects, you cannot really fundamentally tell them apart at all. So they are truly indistinguishable in this particular sense. So this changed the counting. In other words, when you do permutations and combinations, if you say these are distinct permutations or these are distinct combinations, then they're not really. So that changes the number of modes that you are counting, you know, different uh, kinds of configurations that you might be counting. And that resolved a very important puzzle in quantum mechanics at the time because of both. So now we put together this indistinguishability along with this minus one uh, thing. And there's a little illustration here. I don't know if I can run it. Maybe I can try to run it. It's, it's a completely classical analogy, of course. There's nothing quantum here. Uh, I don't know if I can stop it at the right place. But you might have noticed when this coin rolled around the other coin and it was down here, and I'll try it once more. Maybe I can stop it here. I couldn't stop it at the right place. But if you saw what it was doing right there, the coin had rotated by 360 degrees around itself, which means if that was an electron, it would have a phase of minus one. It would have had a negative wave compared to where it was before. You would also notice that the two coins have changed positions. In other words, the coin at the top is now the coin at the bottom. So this is much better described by Feynman. If you look at Feynman's lectures of physics, he describes it much better than I did, uh, which is that the interchange of two electron-like objects is the same thing as leaving one electron alone and rotating the other electron by 50 degrees. Right? So this is a completely classical analogy. It's not really quantum at all, but there's a better way of looking at it that explains this. So this means the exchange of two electrons implying the negativity of one of them compared to the other, which hasn't changed, means that the two, of two let's say two object wave function or the two object function describing the system under interchange becomes the negative of itself. So this is the famous um, yeah, anti-symmetry of fermionic systems, the anti-symmetry of matter-like particle systems that under the interchange of any two of them, the entire wave becomes the negative of itself. If you now say, but I want to do one other thing at the same time, I want to put two electrons at the same place at the same time. So now you take the Bose logic that they're indistinguishable. And if they're in the same place at the same time, that function, the two object function really cannot be different if you interchange, right? So in the special case, you get the condition that the two uh, electron wave function is the same as before. So you are stuck with a conundrum that in one sense, you have to have the negative of itself. In the other sense, you have to have the same as itself. And you can see right away, there's only one way out of this, that this entire function has to become zero when two electrons are at the same place at the same time. So this is crucial because this explains why matter 
behaves like matter. This theory becomes a matter theory for all matter particles. It is the origin of the Pauli exclusion principle that says all matter particles with a spin of a half. So this is how we understand matter particles. Because they have this special spin or angular momentum of one half in units of angular momentum, then they follow this logic, which put, put together with this logic means you get an exclusion principle if you try to put them in the same state, same place, same time, or any other way of describing the same state. So this is why matter occupies volume. In other words, if you were to put one electron outside a proton and then a second electron, it must occupy a different state. If you put one more electron, it must occupy yet another different state. And therefore, the atom starts to build up and it has larger and larger volumes because you can't fill the same state with more than one electron at a time. So this explains the shell structure of the atom and therefore the entire sort of growth of the radius of the atom and so forth. So explains why atoms have volume, for example. Then you come to the other aspect of the theory of particle physics as it was evolving, which is how do you predict forces? So we sort of have an idea of what how matter works, and now we go to the theory of forces. Theory of forces is in some sense quite understandable even classically. So ultimately it is turned into a quantum version, but even classically the idea of a Coriolis force is well known. You, know, you do ninth grade classical mechanics and you say, if I want to understand with Newton's laws how the air movement on the surface of the earth should be understood, there is in some sense a real force which is the high pressure at the pole and the low pressure at the equator driving the wind from the pole to the equator. So the wind is flowing sort of down from the pole towards the equator. But then why does it appear to us like the wind is also blowing at the same time from the east to the west? So we learn about this in geography. These are the famous westerly winds. And the reason is the wind motion in some inertial sense is really coming down this way. But at the same time, the earth is rotating from west to east. So it looks to us like there is also a deflection effect from east to west. In other words, these non-inertial or accelerating frames are creating the impression that there are additional forces because we sort of insist that all forces. So even if the acceleration is not due to a real force, just the non-accelerating frame of reference generates the impression that there are additional accelerations and therefore there are additional forces. So now you take this idea and you say, all fundamental forces aren't really real at all, that you just put your system, your classical system or your quantum system in some kind of accelerating frame, and you can define that exactly. And the naturally the accelerating frame would generate the impression, which means in your equations, additional terms would show up. And those additional terms behave like the Coriolis force. It and is. that really is what we call force. In other words, just transformations of matter particles and so on in accelerating frames gives the impression that they are interacting by forces. So this actually has turned into the real theory of forces. All forces are now understood as the effects or artifacts in some sense of non-inertial transformations. Okay? So this is the reason we understand how a hurricane appears to be rotating. It's really what is happening is the earth is rotating the other way. And in some inertial frame, if you observe it, it would look like the air is moving radially but the Earth's rotation creates the, 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 the sense that the hurricane winds are actually rotating. So now you take all of this classical logic and you quantize it. And there you say, there is a minimum quantum of any wave and that is the, the particle-like nature eventually manifests itself. So just like a wave can transport energy and momentum, then eventually the quanta of the wave also transport energy and momentum. So that is how you now understand eventually that when particles exchange quanta of the waves, the electric wave or something like this, that really means you're exchanging a photon and that's how you experience an attraction force or a repulsion force. So here is the quantum description of two electrons experiencing a force by the exchange of the quantum of electromagnetism. So that's the photon. And this is a picture of Richard Feynman explaining the Feynman diagrams to his students. So this is, uh, the most accurate logic that has ever been tested. So it's sort of quite a grand success of physics and mathematics, that it's a mathematical principle that has been experimentally tested to an extreme precision. And I think it's actually true that there has been no um, physical evidence that has been explained by a theory consistently at this kind of precision. So in some sense, quite a grand success of science. And needless to say, uh, especially at this institution, one of Baba's many contributions was, we still call this Baba scattering. Um, I guess he wrote these down, that, that Feynman diagrams like this 
would also explain the scattering of electrons with positrons. So matter antimatter interactions could also be understood just like electron electron interactions, just by having quanta of, in this case, electromagnetism being exchanged. So this process is a very common process. For example, at an E plus E minus collider, Baba scattering will seem to be common. And in fact, to a large extent, the rate at which the beam is coming, you know, how many electrons are coming this way, how many positrons are coming this way at LEP, for example, was actually counted because this is a very precise calculation. So you see how many scatters you're observing, you know the rate at which the scattering should occur, and that tells you what is the intensity of your electron and positron beams. So Baba scattering counting was the way to measure luminosity. Okay. So now this logic is extended to the weak force. So, so far we sort of gave analogies from the electromagnetic force. The weak force is the one that created historically the beta decay from a nucleus. And at some point it was understood that that's really the neutron turning into the proton, some neutron here turned into a proton. And the famous prediction that energy and momentum were not conserved in a two body interaction. And that led to the prediction that there had to be a third object coming out in the decay, which became the famous neutrino. So this had to be a three body decay so that you could explain the spectra of energy and momentum, two body decay wouldn't do it. So eventually this picture was turned into particle physics to so that picture. The neutron and the proton were understood to be understood to be in a simple at a certain simple level, a combination of three quarks. And you can see one of the quarks is turning into a different kind of quark. And in the process, another quantum of this time, the weak force is actually being exchanged, not the electromagnetic. And that quantum is where we introduce the W boson. And that one is now decaying to the electron and neutrino. So it looks just like the diagrams we saw earlier. But instead of this electromagnetic force, it's the weak force deviating this. So just like the weak force gets quantized to the, uh, just like the electromagnetic force gets, force gets quantized by photons, the weak force gets quantized by three objects, not one, W plus, W minus, and a Z. And the reason why three and not one is that the non-inertial transformation, which is the basis of all the forces, is exactly the transformation that goes around on a sphere. So just like the rotating earth, we did the Coriolis force logic, the mathematics here is actually identical. So in the quantum version, you say, the particles that are experiencing the force are sitting at the poles of the sphere. And the transformations on the sphere are either one up, going to from south to north, or there's a transformation from north to south, or there is a third transformation around the equator. So the three transformations that you can make on the surface of a ball are exactly depicted or, or showing up in the quantum version by saying the W plus boson will take you from one pole to the other, the W minus will take you the other day, and the Z boson, the third one, is the, th is the one that you need to complete that set of transformations, which is the one that takes you around the equator. So those are the three transformations that form the group that allow you to move on the surface of sphere as you like. And so those three elements, or those three fundamental components of the total transformations possible on a ball become the three W plus, W minus, and the Z boson. So that's the origin of the Z boson in the quantum, W boson and the Z boson in the quantum version of the weak interaction. So the weak interaction is not so, you know, its effect on our lives and so on is, is in fact very important and yet it's not so visible to us. You know, the electromagnetic interaction is completely dominating our lives to a large extent. Then of course the force of gravity is dominating our lives to a large extent. But even though we may not think about it very often, for example, inside the sun, the fusion of hydrogen to helium means you have to ultimately take four protons and make a single helium nucleus, which has two neutrons. So somewhere here, you have to turn a proton to a neutron and that's actually happening in the beginning. And so the slowest reaction in all of this is the reaction mediated by the W boson here. In that process, you see the lifetime of this, particular, the half-life of this uh, reaction is the longest by uh, any means compared to any other step in this chain reaction. So the rate at which the sun is fusing hydrogen to helium, that rate is dominated by the rate at which this first reaction is occurring, which is controlled by the W boson, which is controlled by the weak interaction. And you can imagine that that rate is crucial. If the sun was fusing hydrogen to helium much slower or much faster, then that nuclear furnace would have a very different equilibrium, a much smaller sun or a much faster burning sun, much larger sun. So the reason the sun is around for you know 5 billion years and the earth came out of it, and now we have the right 
kind of energy flux from the sun that supports life here and so on. All of that owes itself in some way to the reaction rate right at the beginning here. So we owe something to the weak interaction right here in telling us how the sun would work, why the sun works the way it does. Hi, and, um, Professor Kotpal is yes? here. The question, there's a question in the first row. Ah, here we yeah. are, yes. So how does one look at the rates there? The the the, the rates that you wrote, uh, 10 to the power nine, 10 to the power six years, and then one second. How does one sort of compute these rates? Or it's known, how, how did one uh, know these rates? You mean, how can these be calculated? Uh, yes, in the sense, uh, computed. By now, the, the theory of these interactions is extremely well established. Okay. So the weak interaction and exactly what the wave function, I mean, you're asking perhaps a detailed question of what exactly is the wave function of the deuteron and therefore- No, I'm completely, the out of the so field. I'm completely out of the field. Ah, so okay. I, would, I would just like to know, these numbers are given, they are calculated by standard uh, yes. theory. Of yes, they are calculated part. and they're exactly calculable. And I'm sure, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I'm sure that many of these nuclear physics rates, in fact, I suspect almost all of the nuclear physics rates that you can imagine are also measured. Right? So these rates, I'm sure, are measured and calculated and they are in agreement. Okay, okay, thank the, you. Th there is, the subtlety, of course, in quantum mechanics is what is the degree of overlap or how we say, what exactly is the wave function overlap that is required to compute the matrix element? Okay. So, so now I'm getting into the quantum language. That's fine. Should, That's why we skip it. So in, in some sense, the fundamentals of the quark level process of how the quarks are annihilating into a W boson or turning into electron neutrino, those are high, high precision calculations. Okay. The lower precision part of it is exactly what is the wave function of the quarks in the nucleus. And that part is difficult to calculate quantum chromodynamics, which I haven't even mentioned okay. yet. Okay. So sometimes this, these kind of processes are inverted to figure out what the strong dynamics is, because that's non-perturbative calculations. In other words, many body calculations of a reaction rate, which is difficult. I'm using too many words now that are getting way advanced. That's right. That's so, right. Let me just put it this way. The quark level process or the fundamental level processes that are going on here are all extremely well calculated and in agreement with all kinds of data, except the topic of today's lecture. So that's the first time something very different has shown up. The rest of it is the, the difficult quantum mechanics of many body physics. So it's always been true that even classical in many body physics is difficult and that doesn't get solved easily in quantum mechanics either. So when you have multiple quarks and all other objects bound together like this, what exactly is the dynamics of that is the difficult part. Having said that, it's been done, I think. Okay, uh, let's move on. So there is the other, the many aspects, but here is another nice aspect. You see the chain reaction of radioactive elements uh, in the Earth's mantle. For example, uranium, thorium, and potassium are the dominant ones. So these are radioactive elements in the mantle which are undergoing radioactive decay. And you can see right in the beginning of that decay chain, there is the weak decay, again, attributed to the W boson. And this radioactivity is a source of heat and not all of it, but a lot of the heat produced by the earth from these processes is responsible for the fact that the earth's core is still molten. I mean, four and a half billion years, you can calculate if the earth's core would have cooled down by now. And it hasn't for various reasons. And one of them, a large factor of it, is the radioactivity in the mantle. The moltenness of the Earth's core and the fact that it's a iron nickel core means that electric currents can circulate in that core. And that means those electric currents produce magnetic fields. And this magnetic field is crucial. It's a protective shield for all life on the surface of the Earth in the sense that protons coming from the sun's corona those charged particles are not hitting the equator or not hitting the Earth's direct surface, but are deflected by the magnetic force of the Earth's magnetic field so that they get concentrated on the poles. So that is why the aurora borealis, the northern lights and the southern lights are occurring on the poles because the radiation gets focused there. So a lot of the radiation that would have hit the surface of the Earth doesn't. And so that helps protect life on the surface of the Earth. So a rather important aspect. I'll quickly mention Sudarshan who had enormous contributions in many aspects of physics, including particle physics. And one of the early things he did with uh, his advisor, Robert Marshak, is in fact, write down a specific quantum form for the weak interaction, which turned out to be right. Um, and things happen. Uh, 
maybe he didn't publicize it so much and other people like Feynman and Gelman perhaps publicized it more. So this really owes its existence or this formulation owes its, uh, its first formulation to Sudarshan and Marshak and some people think he should have won the Nobel Prize, uh, but he has passed now. So this logic is all good. It explains all the forces, except for the fact that these logics are based on certain symmetry transformations, what goes around in mathematics as symmetry. And symmetry transformations should not involve any energy cost. So therefore, the quantized versions of these particles that are mediating the force should not incur any energy cost in the original logic, which transforms into the statement that they must be massless particles. So we know this logic works exactly for photons. You know, all measurements of photons show that they are massless to a very high precision. But the weakness of the weak force was attributed to the W boson being very heavy. So that's a direct flaw in the rest of the logic. How can you have massive force carrying particles when the logic says they should be massless? So this was a big question and that's the beginning of the Higgs logic. So about 1950s or so, people started thinking about this and there's a long history to how the thought developed. Eventually it got the name Higgs because of one paper that was written by Peter Higgs, but many people were thinking about this, that in the quantum language, you would say that there is a ground state sitting in the vacuum. Or you can say in classical language, there's a condensate that fills up the entire vacuum. In other words, the vacuum is some non-trivial situation. It's not really empty, but it is filled up with this stuff. So this new quantity called Higgs. And then all other particles interact with the vacuum. Instead of going right through at the speed of light as massless particles should, they start interacting. And you can classically think of it as friction or sort of bouncing around or waveguide logic, many ways of looking at it. But it's sort of easy to understand from special relativity alone that if any particle has an interaction with the Higgs and so it's bouncing around as it goes through, that would appear to us as if its velocity is lower than the velocity of light. And that automatically by special relativity means it has the kinematic property of mass. So this is how you generate the effect of mass by causing interactions of everything with the Higgs field while not violating any of the rules that originally described all the matter and force interactions. So you get the best of everything. And this was the origin of the Higgs and the matter and the force. So that's the standard model all put together. So it, it's, it's a very crude analogy, but a fast moving particle has low friction and a slow moving object through water has a high friction coefficient and the water plays the role of the Higgs field in that analogy. So those friction coefficients are not understood at all. Everything else we talked about was fairly axiomatic but just invo invoking some kind of number that says the particles interaction with the Higgs field is some lambda and whatever va lambda value you give it will then control what mass you get is sort of a partial explanation, but you might say that it's not really a satisfying explanation. So that is the level of understanding we have of the Higgs effect on everything else and why the masses turn out to be what they are. We are just replacing the mass parameters by some friction coefficient parameters, if you, if you ask me. And many people would agree that that requires a deeper explanation. So we are not done yet by any means. Okay. And now once you have a field, then in quantum mechanics, fields become waves and waves get quantized. So the smallest quantum of a wave in the Higgs field, that ripple, for example, is what a Higgs boson is. So we talked about protons and neutrons. So those were the two quarks and the electron neutrino. Now we know after another 40, 50 years that the matter content is not just these two quarks, but these six and the uh, electron and neutron also have these partners here. And it's not really understood at all why there are these three generations, not two and not five. Uh, and so many people would say that also requires a better explanation in particle physics. So this is the state of affairs at the moment. Okay? And then there is this mathematical way of writing it that describes all the force uh, mechanics. And this is the mechanics describing the matter fields interacting with the force field in here. So a rather short looking expression is actually capturing with all the math axioms behind it, all the interactions of matter and forces, everything put together. So it's, it's a quite a grand achievement in some sense that the mathematics is working to help us understand nature at such a deep level, one might say. Okay, so now let's come closer to what the W boson can tell us more. There is a very interesting thing that goes on as soon as you put the uncertainty principle that the vacuum becomes a, a pretty rich system. The vacuum, all of these stories, now we heard about the Higgs field, now we're talking about the vacuum again from this other perspective. It all boils down to quantum again, 
um, this equation at the top is the same uncertainty relation, but it's in flipped around. So now that delta E is here, delta time is there. What is this saying? This is saying that fundamentally you can't know time and energy at the same time with infinite precision. That's the basics of quantum. And that means that if you don't know the energy of a system very precisely, it means you are able to violate energy momentum conservation because since you don't know exactly what the number has to be, you can borrow energy from nature for a certain amount of time. And the shorter the amount of time you make that borrowing, the larger the energy borrowing you can make. In other words, you cannot say that energy momentum is violated, conservation is violated, as long as the violation happens for a time commensurate with this equation. So you can violate energy momentum conservation in a sense by larger and larger amount if you do it for a shorter and shorter amount of time. It's like you can take larger and larger energy loans as long as the time period of the loan, the maturity of the loan is shorter and shorter. So what this means is the vacuum isn't a dull, empty, nothing there, not at all. It's in fact like a bubbling foam and particles are popping out of the vacuum all the time, like a bubble happens. And before this time expires, the bubble has to collapse. So the short time you look at it, there are more and more bubbles happening all the time. So it's a very rich and dynamic system in the vacuum is when you apply quantum principles to the vacuum. So this is some computer generated image of that. It is saying, look at any point in space and time, suddenly you will see a vacuum fluctuation there. And before you can strictly say that, oh, that energy came from where, you know, energy momentum is not conserved. Before you can do that, the amount of time you have, the bubble will collapse. And so you'll never spot it. And so you'll never actually violate energy and momentum classically, even though in some sense it is being violated quantum mechanically. So, so the vacuum actually looks like this. It's, it's a foaming, bubbling system all the time. So this actually was measured in a sense by Willis Lamb. It was not known at the time what he was measuring. He found these two states of the hydrogen atom and their energy levels were very precisely known or they thought they knew. But what he measured was one part per million, tiny, tiny effects So precision physics, different from what the energy levels were supposed to be. So this became a pretty important thing because people thought the theory of matter and electric magnetic forces was becoming quite well understood. So one part per million effect, if it is significantly measured, becomes an important um, piece of information. As time went on, you can see another 10 years, a lot of theorists, including these famous names, were working on a quantum theory of electricity magnetism. And they showed that this vacuum effect is real. In other words, here is a photon mediating the proton-electron interaction. So this is a hydrogen atom. But this photon is splitting up into an electron-positron pair. And before you can spot it like that, it disappears. But the property, the net property of electricity and magnetism being depicted here is actually changed by the fact that the quantum form is active. In other words, these energy levels that were supposed to be the same are actually slightly affected by this vacuum foam. And that slight effect is the one part per million effect. So when these calculations were finally demonstrated to agree with, say, Willis Lamb's experiment and other such experiments, then it became a very strong proof that the strange quantum stuff happening in the vacuum is actually a real effect. And it's affecting the properties of the vacuum and therefore affecting the properties of all interactions and all matter particles in a quantitative way. And so the fact that you could calculate them and measure them and have an agreement at the level of part per million was quite a grand success. Okay. So now you go to the strong interaction here and the same mediator of the strong force also experiences vacuum fluctuations. So here is another demonstration. Um, I'm not sure I'm pointing in the right place. Here we are. Here is the mediator of the strong force undergoing vacuum fluctuations. And again, the net effect of these fluctuations is the fact that the strength of the strong force, the, 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 how the quarks would interact via the strong force, whether that's a strong interaction or a weak interaction, the probability of the interaction, for example, is actually calculated to be reducing, here it is shown to be reducing, as a function of energy. So as you go to higher energy, you're sampling more and more higher energy vacuum fluctuations and it was calculated that that should actually reduce the strength of the strong force. Experiments were done, here are the data points, and you can see that that reduction is actually matched by, or the, the measured strength is matched by the theoretical calculation. So another grand uh, proof, experimental proof, 
that the effects of these vacuum fluctuations are actually real, calculable, and affect um, natural phenomena. So um, maybe I'll go very quickly through one last piece of logic that also explains the importance of these vacuum fluctuations. We know about dark matter. So here is a sort of depiction of a galaxy with a large halo of dark matter around it. The measurements of dark matter in the universe. So this is like a map looking at some part of the universe and sort of mapping out the dark matter. It turns out the dark matter is not distributed uniformly. It's not just all over the place, but there are large regions where there essentially is no matter energy and the dark matter happens to be concentrated around these filament-like regions and the galaxies are also positioned along those filament-like regions. So the dark matter and the visible matter is all concentrated around uh, some part of the total space and most of it is, is not there. So what would create this strange looking distribution of the dark matter and the visible matter from the beginning of the universe? Um, in fact, galaxies have been observed which are almost 90% dark matter, not even 80, but 90%. So gravitational measurements are showing the dark matter is having these distributions. Here's another map of the dark matter and galaxies. So the logic of how this distribution occurred has now come back to these quantum fluctuations and quantum foam. And here is some more evidence. So in 1964, independently of the dark matter, some people were making uh, radio wave measurements and they found this famous microwave radiation, which also got a Nobel Prize, that wherever they pointed this antenna, they were seeing the same, essentially the same amount of microwave radiation from all directions of the sky. So the first expectation is, you know, okay, galaxies, maybe stars, there is electromagnetic radiation from them. So there should be point sources or galactic sources of, uh, of radio waves. How could it be so uniform across the whole sky? If you're looking at a galaxy, you're looking where there's nothing there, it's the same amount of radiation, sounded very uh, interesting and, and indicative of something important. As time went on, people said, let's make this uniform radiation more and more precisely measured until they reached a precision of 10 to the minus five. So these little hot and cold regions are sort of a color depiction of the microwave radiation being slightly more intense and slightly less intense by something like 10 to the minus five. So very, very, very small perturbations on something almost uniform. So this became very important and people started making more satellites and measured those fluctuations even more accurately. So this is a map. So these tiny fluctuations in the microwave radiation and that distribution of dark matter and, and visible matter all of this uh, sort of semi-random looking structure eventually got understood from the perspective of the quantum foam. So this has been worked out and the calculation at the time of the Big Bang, again, doing what the vacuum would be doing, fluctuating in and out due to quantum mechanics. Those fluctuations today have to disappear because there is no energy available. So the by energy momentum conservation during the time delta T, the delta E fluctuation has to vanish. But when the universe is very strongly expanding at the time of the Big Bang, then energy conservation is obviously broken. There is a huge amount of energy just generated by the fact that the expansion is happening. So energy conservation is not true at that time. So there was actually enough energy available back then that the vacuum fluctuations, instead of being fluctuations and having to disappear, they actually became real fluctuations and got frozen because the available energy was actually there. So the one thing that, that changes between the vacuum here and the vacuum at the time of the Big Bang is vacuum fluctuations can become real classical fluctuations that are permanently frozen in because the energy that you needed to make that fluctuation is now available because the universe is expanding and producing all that energy. So those fluctuations became real density variations at the time of the Big Bang. And those density variations then started attracting by their gravity, the dark matter around them which eventually started attracting the visible matter and that led to the galaxy formation. So if you took all the dark matter and visible matter and just spread it out uniformly over the whole expanding universe, you wouldn't get the pattern of accretion and density um, clustering and so on, which is crucial of course, for us to be here. Right? The galaxies create high density regions for stars to form and planets to form and all of this. None of them would happen. And so in some sense, the, the vacuum fluctuations back there are part of the reason why the universe has this highly non-uniform structure and therefore it allows 
um, complicated systems to be developed and, and so forth. Okay? So this is where the W boson comes in. So without going into too much detail, we have a certain level of particle content that we understand. We know what the matter content is, or so we think. We know what the Higgs theory at the moment is. So all of the particles and interactions that we know about, they're all participating in the vacuum fluctuations. So it's like the willis lamb effect. You see the W boson coming, having some vacuum fluctuation, and then going back to what it was. So the name of the game is take your existing matter and energy content of the universe, calculate all the vacuum fluctuations in the W boson, and the quantity that it computes for you is the mass of the boson. So physical parameter that is affected by these things is the physical mass, the observable mass of this boson wave that is going along. Now, if you miss something, in other words, if nature actually contains additional particles or additional forces or additional dynamics of any kind, then by the rules of quantum, even those have to participate in the vacuum fluctuations. In other words, unless there is a specific rule that some particular interaction is prohibited, all possible vacuum fluctuations must happen. That one of the axioms of quantum, that everything must happen unless it is prohibited by some rule. So what is done here is you calculate some subset of the vacuum fluctuations to the left, and you call those the known standard model of physics prediction. And then you can take some additional prediction with additional particles. You may have a, a supersymmetric particles or additional Higgs bosons or additional forces. Whatever quantum theory you want to build beyond the known one, you can calculate the vacuum fluctuations from those. And so now it's a simple thing. You make a measurement and you say, does it agree with the known calculation or does it agree with the hypothetical calculations of additional things? Right? So it's, it's a hypothesis testing game. So the hypothesis is this is the number from all the quantum uh, corrections or quantum fluctuations that we know about. That's the ones in the standard model of physics. And if you get a number very different from this, then you are saying potentially it means there are additional vacuum fluctuations or additional dynamics going on. We don't know which ones of the possibilities, but we know there is something more. So that is where we are headed. And you can do additional calculations like supersymmetric particles and many things about supersymmetric can be said, but we can leave that for Q&A if, if there is time. So here is the status at 98. So the measurement accuracy for MW and this other particle top quark, you can see, for example, in the vertical direction are the large measurement uncertainty. So you can do the calculations from the known particles called standard model or with additional supersymmetric particles. So this is minimum supersymmetric standard model extension, green region versus orange. But you could not tell the difference. Within that uncertainty, both possibilities were equally valid. In 2012, of course, the Higgs boson was found and soon after the mass of the Higgs boson was very well calculated. So that contribution to the calculation got pinned down. And effectively, this known theory of matter forces and Higgs became pretty accurate, at least within the, the axioms that it had used. So then the calculation collapses to this purple line. So now the game becomes, do you make a measurement? You don't know where it's going to be. So you make it as accurately as possible. And then you get to see whether it lies on the line or it lies somewhere else, if it's not on the line. And you know where the story is ending with my talk soon, that what this paper is saying is it happens to be not on the line and it's significantly different from the line so one possibility is it is this calculation that is the valid one and not the one that we have been believing, but there are other possibilities. So time will tell where the story ends. I, um, how much time more we have? Five minutes? 10 minutes? Okay, then we can certainly finish in 10 minutes. So finally, let's say a few words about how do you do it and right? how do you make the measurement of the W boson at the level of 0.01%. Uh, Why do I pick this number? because that's the accuracy with which the calculation can be done. So of course, you'd like to measure more accurately if possible, but you certainly want to measure with a similar accuracy so that you can see if there is a difference. And the more significant the difference is, the more seriously you would take it, as in always in science. So the complication with measuring the mass of any object which are decaying quickly, so just like the W goes on decays very quickly to electron neutrino, these particles are not long lived, which means by e equals mc square, measuring the mass of this object really means measure the energies of all the decaying objects. And then you say the total energy observed in the decay or momentum observed in the decay 
can be used to infer from special relativity what the mass of the decaying object is. So it's just energy and momentum conservation coupled with E equals MC square. The trouble is you can measure the electron new energy, for example, accurately. So you do that as much as possible. So here's the accuracy achieved, 0.004%. But the other half of the energy, which is the neutrino, is undetectable, um, has a very, very, very small interaction. It's the weak interaction again, so you can hardly see the neutrino. So that one escapes, and now you don't know how to do energy momentum conservation if you only have half the energy is visible. So that's what makes it so much more complicated than the measurements of the masses of other objects where everything is in a final state is visible. So here you can't detect half of it. So you have to do a lot of make other measurements and apply all kinds of constraints and apply all kinds of inferences. So that's the reason it. I've been working on this for 10 years and before that another 15 years. And every experiment that has tried this has typically taken four, five, six years to do all the inferences as accurately as possible until you uh, arrive at a precise measurement. So the basic reason is the existence of the neutrino, which carries away a lot of energy and momentum and you have to infer it all. So a few words on detection technology and experimental technology. Typically all collateral experiments look like this. So the beam is coming in and out of the screen and all sensors are placed with roughly as concentric barrels, so going out and out. And in some sense, they act like filters. So every sensor has a specific response to a particular kind of particle. So then you do the coincidence. You say, for example, that this type of sensor detects photons, but the other sensors do not have a photon signal. So if you only see a signal in the red sensor, but nothing else, you would say, therefore, by logical exclusion, that particle must be the photon. Here is something else that sees uh, sensors lighting up here, here, and here. That coincidence is specific to some particles, but not others. So therefore, it must be those. So just by having many, many sort of orthogonal sensors and looking for the matching or the lack thereof of the different types of sensors, you get to decide whether the particle is an electron or something else or neon or whatever. So here you see the actual implementation. This is about three or four stories high. And those circular regions, you can see a, a detector here, another detector there, another detector there. And those are the different kinds of sensors I was pointing to earlier. Here is the one that plays an important role. So this is called a drift chamber. It's about 1.3 meters in diameter. It's about human size. And another graphical depiction of the distribution of those sensors, let's move on. But I'll focus on the drift chamber for a few minutes. What happens is this is a large volume. It's about the size of the screen, a little smaller than this. This is almost life size, not really much different than what you see here. These wires are very long and they're placed at high voltage in a gas. So when the charged particles come through the gas, they ionize the gas. The high voltage will attract the electrons and the other wire, the low voltage wire will attract the ions, the, the positive ions. So now you build an electronic circuit that will measure the time of the ions drifting and the electrons drifting. So by drift time times the drift velocity, which you know, you will extract the drift distance. So you will extract where is the position of this particle relative to the wire. So now all that remains to know is what is the actual position of the wire. And now you know the point. So you get all the points mapped out and then you apply classical physics. You say you have a large magnetic field that exerts a magnetic force. If you know the magnetic field and you know the radius of the circle, which you are tracking, literally from point to point you're tracking, circle radius and magnetic field tell you what the magnetic force must have been and therefore what the uh, energy of the particle must have been. So this is just textbook physics from, uh, from magnetic force. And here's a real picture. So you see all these black points are the actual wire positions that were sensed. Uh, when there are 50 to 100 particles, it looks very, very busy. So some elaborate software program has to be written to, to compute all those trajectories. So you see all those gray lines and so on are the individual particle trajectories being um, reconstructed, we say. So let me quickly move to alignment. So one thing we said was you've got to know those positions very accurately so that you can infer what the radius of that circle is. And the accuracy of the radius turns into the accuracy of the energy movement. So on the bottom plot, you will see this is 10 microns plus or minus, and you will see the wires are being aligned to something like one micron accuracy when they started with an accuracy of 50 to 100 microns. So the long, you know, took us three or four years to develop the techniques to get such a large device with all the 30,000 wires aligned, or which means we know their positions over you know, many, many meters, 
to individual accuracies of roughly one micron each. So now it comes down to measuring the magnetic field. And the basic idea is you take a particle with a known energy, known mass. You measure the mass of that object within your own detector. Uh, something simple, not like the W, but something much simpler. And then that becomes a calibration of the magnetic field. So you infer what your magnetic field must be because the measured mass of this particle in our own experiment has to be the same as what we already know from some other experiment. So that's what we call the calibration. And then we do a demonstration of the Z boson I mentioned earlier. The Z boson is another precisely known object. Our philosophy has been that we want to prove that the W boson mass measurement is as accurate as we say. So one thing we can do is make the Z boson mass measurement ourselves and then compare to the known value. And if it comes out right, then that's a big sort of confidence booster. And this is a technique we've done three times in the last 22 years, but other experiments who are attempting the W boson mass measurement haven't actually made this demonstration. And they've tried, I believe, but, and it would be nice if that was done in the future. I mean, personally, of course, it would, you know, there's an interest in getting this measurement reproduced. So one of the things that justifies the accuracy is this kind of cluster. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll just flash a distribution from which you extract the mass. Basically, the shape of this distribution, you see the blue points of the data, the shape of the distribution is sensitive to what the actual W boson mass is. So you do a very precise calculation of what that shape is for all your hypothesis. And then you are simply doing statistics to say which hypothesis works or which hypothesis is the most consistent with the data. And that gives us this picture. So you have seen this one, we can move on. Last few things. So people are now thinking very hard what are the implications, theoretical implications? In other words, what additional ingredients to nature should you add to our existing standard model of physics? And these are many buzzwords. Uh, they, you know, they mean something to the people who do these calculations, but they're essentially adding additional forces or additional matter content or some additional property of, of matter and forces or Higgs or something like this, so that you get additional contributions from the vacuum form or something changes and it's calculable what the effect of the W boson mass would be. And some of these ideas are not compatible with our measurements, so they get dropped and the surviving ideas will get pursued. So many ideas being pursued, you can see within a few weeks or a few months, uh, you know, 150 papers or something like this already been published. Okay. I'm going to skip uh, this antimatter uh, uh, logic. If time allows, you can ask me about it. And let me wrap up. So. The beginning of our discussion here, the whole logic was, why is the W boson mass such an important thing? And you sort of seen me explain a little bit how it becomes sensitive to what is happening in nature that we know and what additional things might be happening in nature that we don't know. And what we know is encapsulated in this calculated number. What we are measuring is this number. And you can just do the basic math and you can see that they are not in agreement uh, and the quantifiable statement is it's more than phi sigma, so it is to be taken seriously. So here's what I would end. It appears like the logic we have built so far with matter forces and the Higgs, which generates the masses for all the particles, appears to be not the end of the story. It seems like there is more particle physics to come. So let's see what happens at all the particle physics experiments that are happening worldwide, including the Large Hadron Collider. Many of those ideas being discussed actually can be directly observed at the Large Hadron Collider. You might have heard there is talk about a next collider in Japan, perhaps, or in China, or in Europe, uh, a linear collider of E plus E minus, or Europeans are thinking of an electron positron collider also 20 years from now. And many of these things are also quite directly measurable those, uh, in those colliders as well, if the LHC or other experiments being done worldwide don't see it. So. It, it depends on how you modify the calculation. Some of that parameter space is discoverable in the next 10 to 20 years. Some of it is not, but we'll see how, how all this evolves. Right? So on that note, I thank you for your attention and timing allowing, I'm happy to take questions. Perfect. Thank you very much. Let's have a big round of applause for Ash Professor Ashutosh Kotwal. It's a very nice colloquium. Um, now uh, I will take questions first from the audience here. So are there questions? Please raise your hand and I can give you a mic. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, so before we, um, you know, sort of, uh, the thing is, uh, right now we have one measurement from one experiment yes. at MCDF. And uh, as you very well know that the Higgs boson was discovered by two experiments. So it will be really interesting. And what is your take, let's say, from LSC, but particularly Atlas and CMS? I know there is an LSCB has one measurement. Yes. Um, basically to verify the kind of uh, stupendous accuracy that you have yes. achieved in CDA. I mean, what is your thinking? Like, uh, can CMS and Atlas uh, achieve this kind of thing? I mean, given the pile up and other kind of problem they are having. So I, I thought if you can just uh, enlighten on that. Uh, so, so problem, the, the word is of course, none of these things are easy as you saw the accuracy you want to achieve on your detector understanding and the physics modeling, a lot of details. So I wouldn't say that it can't be done. I mean, it took this particular answer 10 years and the one before took seven years and the one before took five years. It's always been taking five, six, seven years. Atlas has come out and also took, I believe from 2012 to 2018, so six years. So, so it's, I wouldn't say the problems are insurmountable. So the word problem sounds like the wrong word. Let's start with the Tevatron. So, so my biggest hope, let's say, or uh, anticipation was D0 will come along. It, it's just like CDF, same experiment, same accelerator, same benefits in some way. But they have recently made public statements, uh, and we heard privately, and then they said publicly, that the, the, scintillate, the, the silicon detector and the fiber tracker, I don't know exactly which one, but their track detectors, the ones that tell you where the particles are going and precisely, have suffered some kind of radiation damage. I, I, both experiments all during 2007-8, you know, were very aware of the fact that we are running these sensors for a long time. So radiation damage is a big issue. Um, so I'm a bit puzzled how the CDF sensors survive, same exposure, but somehow the D0 uh, sensors for the latter half of the running have somehow suffered some irreparable damage. So the, lately they have made a statement that they cannot analyze most of their data for that reason. So that was a big, uh, more clearly a disappointment for them, but also for all of us, right? The other experiment, as you say, on the same collider, making a similar precision measurement is the first thing you would like to hope for. So it seems like that won't happen now. The D0 measurement also is only electron channel, so they are not going to do muon channel as far as they have said which means they have a small fraction of the data compared to this one, and the rest of it maybe never gets analyzed. So we'll never get the precision from D0. Now you ask what happens at the LHC. So data shortage is not the issue, the infinite data. Their experiments were built for higher pileup. So we were built for two or three interactions happening at the same time. You saw how the event looks pretty busy. They were built for 10 times as much. So in some sense, it's not like that intrinsically is a problem if it's part of the design. The granularity is much higher, so it should be fine. Um, I know, for example, trying to do the alignment of the Atlas detector at the same level of precision, that something about silicon sensor technology is intrinsically better in the sense that the point resolution is much higher. So individual wire resolution is 100 microns here, point by point. Uh, it's five microns at the LHC experiment. But somehow it seems like that's not the limiting thing. The limiting thing is the systematic accuracy with which you can align 100,000 modules or something like this. So if you have 100 million channels or a billion channels in the future, how well do you know the systematic positions of all those? The degrees of freedom involved in so many different modules placed on high precision barrels, but they can twist this way, this way, this way, this way. So too many degrees of freedom appears to be what is happening. And so you can't quite nail down the positions, which means you can't quite reconstruct the track momentum with this kind of accuracy, which means you can't do the fundamental calibration that we have been pushing for 20 years. So their calibration is based completely on saying it's a zero constraint fit. You just get the Z, whatever you get, you say that one is this number and I'll transfer to the W. So it's transferring from the Z to the W without having all this redundancy from low PT, high PT, medium PT. 
So my feeling is, in principle, the precision could be there. But the difference, you know, the subtle difference between precision and accuracy. Accuracy is how confident are you you're getting the right answer, even though your sensors are giving you high precision numbers. The accuracy issue is, is a different thing. And the construction of Atlas and CMS appear to be all geared towards precision, but not towards accuracy. That's my sense at the, at the moment, with some work myself put in. And I know, for example, that Atlas and CMS tried to do the calibration with the JSIs and the epsilons like we do. They were showing those things for some years and they stopped showing them. So it makes me, so I completely detached from all of that. So now I'm telling you only what I see from the outside. That the attempts to achieve that kind of accuracy and consistency. So you do the same thing three times and you get the same answer. I have a feeling that the consistency checks are failing and it's not so, or somehow it's not easy to understand why they're failing. And so that's why their measurements are all based only on the Z. And in some sense, then that limits you because there's only so many games you can say, play to show that you're doing it right. So, so something we call robustness. Robustness means try to constrain the same thing three different ways. And if you get the same answer, then you're confident. It seems that the, the, the level of confidence you can achieve through robustness is more difficult. Not for the reasons people say. People say it's the luminosity. I don't think it's the luminosity. I think it's the detector design and technology choices, which are completely the right ones for the thrust of the LHC. But it's almost as if for a high precision measurement, you would somehow build differently. <laughs> anyway, long story. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah, I have yes, one please. question related to uh, dark matter mapping. Yeah. So since the chemical composition of dark matter is not known, mm -hmm. which technique is used to map them then? Purely gravitational field. The, 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 the only thing we know about dark matter is by Einstein's theory, it exerts a force of gravity like everything else. So Einstein's logic is any energy at any momentum, any mass, they're all just forms of energy. And all energy, no matter what form it is, generates gravitational force. So dark matter, whatever it is, will generate gravitational force. And everything about the dark matter distribution is done by its gravitational force uh, inferred. So you observe the bending of light, for example, through space. And if it bends in a particular way, you can infer what mass must be doing it. And if there is no visible mass there, then by definition, that's the dark matter. That's all. We know nothing about dark matter except the gravitational lensing effect, basically, or gravitational force effect. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience here? If not, I'll request the Zoom audience if there are any questions from the Zoom audience. I have a couple of questions. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, a recent lattice QCD calculations apparently reduced this discrepancy between uh, the experiment and theory. Any comments? That's the first question. The second is, what are the masses of the W plus and W minus from your analysis? Well, I guess they must be agreeing, but to what uh, level? Yes, I'll answer your second question first. So that is table 11 or something. It might even be in the slides at the back. Okay. The W plus W minus are completely consistent. I think they are one sigma consistent or something like this. I haven't memorized the numbers, okay. but they are at the end of the paper. Mm -hmm. um, so without taking any systematic uncertainties into account, which actually are the t uh, for CDF are small, if you simply take the statistical error on W plus mass fit and W minus mass fit, the actual numbers are completely consistent with those uncertainties alone. Oh. So people have actually said, why don't you do a little further and publish a W plus and W minus because that is a test of CP invariance. Yeah. In the charge parity says so matter and antimatter identical for the weak force. Nobody has the precision we have. So we should get another paper out of it, maybe. So complete consistency there. Your first question, I think, is referring to G minus two, is it? Uh, no, uh, I mean, just the, the corrections that you have, uh, presumably uh, also come from QCD. And so those corrections apparently, or, or maybe, maybe you're right. Uh, but what is the situation with the QCD corrections? 
to this uh, W boson mass. Good. Okay. So on the W boson, all the corrections are purely electroweak. So okay. the W boson being a mediator of the weak force does not experience strong interactions whatsoever. Right? So there is no lattice QCD necessary for W boson mass corrections because all those corrections are only pertaining to supersymmetry theory or weak interaction theory or Higgs theory or something. None of which has any QCD in it. Okay, thank you. Okay. I was mistaken. Yes. I, uh, I think you might be referring. So if you give me another. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you're right. Yeah, you you're might right. be referring to the fact that the G minus two experiment is also yeah. after quantum corrections. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it's the interaction of the of the muon with a photon, mm -hmm. and in the quantum foam that goes on in that interaction, there are QCD contributions as well. So okay. when you say theory versus experiment, the theory needs to contain that QCD interaction, and because it's low energy, unlike this, this is all perturbative physics. It's very high energy, so you can calculate from perturbative logic. In the muon case, you have to do non-perturbative QCD calculation or measurement of some sort and those particular measurements give us the three or four sigma but i know some people are saying that if you recalculate the correction from the calculation <coughs> part from lattice and you don't take it from some experiment then the discrepancy between <coughs> calculated and measured is going down so it's a very controversial question perhaps as to whether you trust the lattice for a calculational aspect or whether you put in a measured quantity into the calculation and get g minus two okay okay thank, thank, you. thank you vivek okay. long thank long you. issue again yeah um i just the last question uh, i will have quick question from tp yeah hi uh, this is from the zoom uh, thanks for a very nice talk I wanted to ask you the this um, a triplet of Higgs SU two L that includes charged Higgs has also been suggested as a possible yes. explanation for the mass anomaly. Yes. What are the prospects for testing and ruling this out? Excellent. So, just just to give a little background to the question, the exact relationship of the weak interaction. So what is the mass of the Z boson and what is the mass of the W boson and what is the precise relationship between them is that precise because it is based on the hypothesis that there is only one Higgs boson. So the calculation has that built in and so that builds a certain uh, linkage between the W and the Z and that tells you given this Z, it must be this W and if you see a different answer, well, there's something more going on. So as you said very rightly, immediately a simple way to change the W and Z relationship is to introduce additional Higgs bosons. It turns out even one is enough, but people have tried three, that there's a good reasons for trying three. The triplet logic immediately turns into the prediction that there must be doubly charged Higgs, so charge one and charge two, uh, just from the known structure of the symmetry logic here. So the doubly charged Higgs is a very good target. We have searched for it at the Tevatron, didn't show up. We searched, I mean, LHC is searching for it also, hasn't shown up. It turns out, I don't quite understand the reasoning, but the effect on the W mass is coming almost entirely from how different is the, is the doubly charged Higgs from the single charged Higgs from the neutral. In other words, you can make all of them heavier and so all of them can escape direct production. You may not have the energy, you may not have the rate if you just make them heavier. Nevertheless, the effect on the W mass survives because it only depends on the difference. So this is a way for that beautiful explanation to kind of escape the LHC detection. That all new particles can become more massive as long as their mass difference is the cause of this effect. Mm -hmm the mass difference is large and so we are seeing the effect but all of the masses being large means direct production is beyond the LHC's scope so that's unlucky uh, if that's how it is evading LHC will run for another 25 years at the same energy as now but the rate will be much higher mm -hmm. so you can then ask the question how much do you increase the mass reach 
by making the luminosity 10 times more, typical is factor of two. So if we're excluding now up to 400 GV, we should be able to reach 800 GV. Mm -hmm. By the time 20 years from now, LHC is completely done. If these triplets are even heavier than one TeV, then for almost all such things, the LHC starts to become not capable. Mm -hmm. So we have to get a little lucky. Okay. And that logic works okay. for dark matter also. If dark matter particles were within six, 700 GV, the LHC is capable of having enough rate. Beyond one TeV starts to get difficult. You don't get enough rate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, TP. Thank you, everyone, for joining into this colloquium. And thank you, Professor Kotpal, for this sure. wonderful Absolutely talk. Welcome. Um, and I would request all of you to uh, give a warm round of applause to Professor Kotpal again. And um, we will have some tea and coffee just outside in the Almond Grove uh, tent. So please join us for some of the refreshments. And we are going to take Professor Kotpal right there. And so, again, thank you for your patience for my that's miscalculation okay. of Bombay raining. That's okay. Just wanted to tell you that this was the final colloquium of this series, um, ending in you know first week of July. We are going to actually return back the last week of July with a mathematician uh, from ISI Bangalore who's going to talk about uh, probability theory and his work. And this is Professor Parthonil Roy from ISI Bangalore. So. I hope to see you in AG66 on July 27th. So thank you. Thank you all for joining in.